and uh, then we have uh, quite a bit of time for a discussion. The real hope here is that uh, we uh, can start uh, projects, perhaps people with uh, ideas as to how to you know, carry these techniques forward can get together. And uh, we'll uh, break off around uh, five. And uh, if you like, there's a reception <coughs> which is uh, something that the uh, math department does here uh, every uh, Friday up in the uh, Science Center at D. So some of us will uh, walk over there. And uh, then uh, for those who have uh, signed up for it, uh, there's a dinner at uh, Changshou at uh, 6.30. So if, if you haven't signed up, uh, there may be a couple places, but you know, ask, ask me if, if, if you have not signed up and you're potentially interested. <laughs> And then we'll just all uh, meet uh, at uh, Changsha for uh, dinner. So uh, with that, uh, let's uh, begin. So uh, we're delighted to have uh, Jim Anderson from Northeastern uh, University to uh, talk about the uh, general topic of uh, machine learning and how one can use it in uh, mathematics. Uh, Jim has been one of the real uh, pioneers in this field. He's done a lot of uh, groundbreaking work in applying these uh, methods in uh, string theory for problems of uh, constructing string vacua, classifying and uh, studying uh, knots, and uh, a wealth of uh, topics. And uh, so he's a perfect person to begin our uh, meeting. So. Like I don't have the mic on appropriately. Uh, Do I need to turn it up? Uh, it's worth a try. So uh, I'm told that uh, there are speakers, so they should be hearing it. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Yeah. I guess for the recording, it's most important. In a room this size, you can project. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Very, uh, okay. Uh, mostly for recording. Okay. But you can proceed. Should I go ahead still? Or? Yeah, I think so. Okay, all right, well, I'll go ahead. Um, I think it's been three years since I put on a mic like this. So, uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Jim. It is good to see you uh, in person. To see faces is wonderful. Um, so, uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm sort of going to give uh, an overview talk for the next little while about this subject generally and some of what some of the opportunities and potential pitfalls are. Uh, and I'm going to try to end, uh, compared to maybe the other talks later, I'm going to try to end with a good deal of time for discussion so that we can uh, have some time to discuss some of the general methodology that we might use in trying to apply machine learning to math. So before I get too far in, it's worth saying that uh, I and a number of people in the audience are affiliated with IFI. This is the NSF AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. Fundamental interactions is code word for physics in this context. <laughs> um, but the basic idea of the Institute is that we're interested in advancing physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe, and in the process, hopefully having some of our ideas affect artificial intelligence directly. So uh, there's all sorts of cool graphics on this page, but maybe yeah. what I would point you to is if you're interested, yeah. check out our website and also check out uh, our, our Twitter feed. I need to check the, I'll check the That seems to be good. Good, okay, it seems like we're good to go. All right, then I'll continue. So uh, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to give a big picture talk about ways that math and ML might interact. So I think one of the big questions that we should be talking about today amongst others is how is it that we're supposed to get rigor and understanding, two of the things that are bedrock and foundational in mathematics, out of techniques that are often stochastic, error-prone, and black box. So uh, in particular, you've probably heard that deep learning is powerful, but deep learning being powerful is not sufficient to uh, necessarily apply it to fields that typically require rigor and understanding. So uh, you're probably very familiar with the fact that, that math is rigorous and involves deep understanding. If you're not as familiar with ML, what I hope is that some of these red items here, that is stochastic, error-prone, and black box, are things that might come up in the talk and that you might learn something about. But so this is the big question uh, that I hope to discuss with many of you today. So the strategies for applying ML to math, there are potentially many, but I'm going to cover two today. So the first that I'm going to cover is what I would call white boxing and conjecture generation. So if ML is black box, you might ask, how can you white box it? How can you open it up and understand it? 
So the basic idea here is that in trying to take an ML technique and white box it and generate conjectures and proof theorems, the first thing you need to do is bring a human expert into the loop in some way, shape, or form. Hopefully have a way to gain some understanding. Maybe after understanding how the machine makes its decisions, you can generate a conjecture and prove some theorems. This uh, part of the talk is going to be a type of machine learning called supervised learning that if you're newer to machine learning, this is one of the canonical types of machine learning that you've probably heard of. But in talking about ML for math, it's important to remember there's many modalities to the way that ML is carried out as, as a, a, a field. Uh, so I'm going to also talk about something called reinforcement learning, which you may have heard of in the context of chess and Go and so forth. And I'm going to talk about how, in mathematics, you might use that for solution verification. And one of the nice things about this is that theoretical guarantees are built in by construction. And in particular, uh, in certain cases, there's interpreta interpretable strategy via rollouts. What that means is if you take a trained agent and you watch it play many games, you can study the statistics of the moves it has tried to make, and you can try to understand what, how is it making its decision and what does it value as a good move. Okay, so that's the outline. And so I'll start with white boxing and conjecture generation. Tim, is it okay if people interrupt with questions, or do you want um, to table it? Yeah. Either way, I'm hoping that in my 50 minutes, I have 15 minutes of discussion and only 30, 35 minutes of presentation. If people have questions, please feel free to interrupt as I go. Um, yeah, so. OK, so the first part of the talk is about white boxing and conjecture generation. And the key point is to try to bring the human in the loop, gain understanding, generate a conjecture, and prove theorems. So first, I need to tell you a little bit about machine learning. So here's the background slide on supervised learning. Uh, machine learning, first of all, is about data. And in the context of supervised learning, what you have is sets of input-output pairs, x, comma, y, drawn from some space x times y. This is very abstract, and it's because the technique can be applied in many, many different areas. In particular, uh, what you would do then is set up what's called a test train split. The idea is that then you would partition the data into two sets, one that is used in training the algorithm, and another that is held back so that you can uh, test the trained algorithm on data that it hasn't seen to see how well it's doing. The basic setup of supervised learning is that your algorithm is going to be some parameterized model, f sub theta, which in the simplest instance of machine learning that we call linear regression uh, is, is just uh, a line with parameters uh, that govern the slope and the intercept. But more generally, f sub theta is a neural network. And the basic idea is that uh, given some predictions of f theta acting on some input data x, and some knowledge of what the ground truth label yi is, there's some sort of function called a loss function that tells you just how good or bad your prediction is. And there's many, many choices for each of these different th things in green that I'm telling you about. But one of the simplest loss functions that you can imagine is to take the prediction of the model, or in many cases, the neural network, on some bit of data and see how uh, well it compares to truth. Take that mean square error and sum it up over all of the samples in your data and call that the loss. Given this loss, if this loss is large, your model is not doing so well. But what you can do is you can use optimization techniques, for instance, gradient descent, to change the parameters of the model to minimize L on the data. And that's a process that is called training in machine learning. So in this context, I have two plots here. In one plot here, you see that the train loss, as training time goes on, is going down very, very nicely, and that the test loss, which is the loss evaluated on the data that uh, was not trained on, is also going down very nicely. This is what you would like to see in machine learning. It means that your algorithm that you train to do quite well with the blue data is actually doing well on unseen data as well. Something else that can happen is that sometimes you're in a situation where training becomes better than the test. So as you train the trained data, the loss gets significantly lower, in this case, than the test data. And this is a phenomenon that's known as overfitting. And this gap between the performance on the data that it's trained on and the data that it's tested on is sometimes called the generalization gap. So this is the rubric for supervised learning. Um, this is a lightning introduction to what is probably the most popular form of ML in the literature. Are there questions at this stage in terms of this framework? Okay. 
Well, we will see it instantiated in, in a number of different cases. But the concern that you might have with techniques like this, remember that the big question for me in this talk is how do we get rigor and understanding out of techniques that are typically stochastic, error-prone, and black box, is the fact that uh, these algorithms are hard to understand. So a simple way to demonstrate the black box concern is for me to tell you about a very simple type of neural network. So a neural network is a parametrized function. Typically, it's a big function in the sense that it's composed out of many other simpler functions with many parameters. Uh, one of the simplest examples is something called a perceptron here. The Ws are matrices, the Bs are vectors, uh, X is the input, sigma is some nonlinear function that is acting entry-wise on this vector, and uh, F is the output of the network. So this is just some function with some nonlinearity, and parameters plugged into matrices and vectors that are called W1, W0, B0, and B1. Uh, I emphasize that these parameters, when you start your code off, are drawn from, are random parameters drawn from some distribution, and uh, that is going to be important in a slide or two. But uh, here, state-of-the-art networks actually have, a, this is a result from last week or the week before, there's a new language model out called Palm from Google that has about 500 billion parameters, and it trains very well, and it can take in text data and do all sorts of cool things, <coughs> but if you were model is doing well, and it has 500 billion parameters, there's a question, you know, this information is encoded in all of these parameters, but how can we actually understand how the neural network makes its decisions? So this is emblematic of what I would call the black box concern in machine learning. But there's other concerns that you might have. One is that if you have a trained algorithm, a trained supervised learning algorithm, in general, it is not 100% accurate. It, is, it fails and it has failure modes. Uh, one might call that error. And in particular, they can even be attacked. So this is a famous example from 2014 where there was a neural network. OK, so we can all agree this is a panda. Uh, and there was a neural network that was trained to recognize pictures in something called ImageNet, which is a big image database. And the network was 57.7% confident that this was a panda. And 0 .007 times some noise was added to the picture. And you can see that when you compose these images, because you can do this on a computer, you still get something back that is obviously a panda. But now the network is 99% confident that it is a gibbon. So in particular, there is error that comes around in neural networks. Uh, hopefully it's not too much. Hopefully you're on some problem you care about getting 98% accuracy. But what about that other 2% is something that we have to ask if we're interested in using this for math. And uh, it can also be attacked in this way. Uh, I mentioned on the last slide that stochasticity enters the game. So statistics, including uh, draws uh, from some distribution of, of some random variable, this is all central to machine learning. So uh, as emphasized, this same equation that I had on the last slide has matrices and vectors of random parameters that are drawn when you start your code. And so if you restart your code, you get a different neural network. And if you train that different neural network, in general, the errors of that trained neural network that started from a different one are going to differ from the errors than if you had started your code the day before. So the errors of the trained network, therefore, depend not only on the data, but also the neural network at initialization. So what are some options for working around this? Uh, there's a, a, a variety of things to talk about here. Uh, white boxing and or interpretable ML is a whole field in and of itself. The big question is how do you open the black box to understand decisions? There are a variety of techniques, some of which are going to be discussed later today, like feature scoring and gradient saliency. saliency. But the simple black box concern in the neural network case is that if you have millions or billions of parameters and somehow the information about the algorithm is encoded in there, how are you supposed to understand that? And one way is to choose a simpler algorithm that doesn't have so many parameters or where the structure of the algorithm is intrinsically giving rise to understanding. So decision trees are simpler than neural networks in general. And these are uh, algorithms that can be part of supervised learning. It's a different type of F sub theta, if you would like that make a prediction based on a flow chart of decisions related to problem features. So this example I found online was apparently trying to classify whether uh, a given set of input features corresponded to a hawk, a penguin, a dolphin, or a bear, according to whether it had feathers, could fly, and or had fins. And given the data that it had, it decided that the most important question to ask first was whether it has feathers, and then to go on down the list. More complicated decision trees can look something like this. And uh, the details of the algorithm, yes, it makes predictions, but you can also open the box, see how it makes its decisions, and figure out what it, the algorithm thinks is most important. 
Uh, given this idea of white boxing, there's a question of whether you can gain some understanding, bring the human into the loop, and uh, turn white boxing into theorems, uh, potentially eliminating error and stochasticity. Well, if you really prove a theorem, in general, it does eliminate error and stochasticity. Uh, so there's uh, different ideas in the literature about how to do this. They're kind of similar. Um, there are probably ones that I'm missing. There's questions of whether we should be doing things different than this. Um, so there's this wonderful paper by DeepMind that came out uh, a few uh, months ago. DeepMind's a very famous ML lab. Um, I'll, because I'm more familiar with it, I'll speak from the example in my own paper. So if you're trying to bring the human into the loop and ask what is a machine learning pipeline for how I might get some sort of conjecture, first of all, what you should do is you should choose your variables wisely. So based on knowledge of the data, based on the domain at hand, you might choose input variables xi that are likely to determine some desired output variable y. Then you would do the machine learning procedure. You would train the, uh, train the network. Uh, this is perhaps the key part. Based on how the decision function uses the inputs to determine the outputs, that's the white boxing, try to come up with some conjecture. Maybe your first pass at the problem, the human is now interacting with the algorithm, right? Maybe your first pass at the problem, when you look at it, you realize, no, no, maybe I should have done this slightly differently. And you reiterate or change your procedure in a way that leads you to refine your conjecture. And this could be some sort of iterative procedure where at the end of the day, uh, you end up with a conjecture that's precise enough and seems good enough for your purposes to actually try to prove it theorem. So this is the sort of pipeline that might allow you to take sort of the stochastic results that sometimes have error from machine learning and to be able to try to uh, turn them into theorems. Uh, so in particular, just to give you uh, one example, this was the one that was in our paper in 2017. Uh, I'll try to use the math language rather than the physics language, given the audience. So we have a, a, a data set, not that we explicitly construct, but that we could construct in principle, of 10 to the 755 elliptically fibered Calabi-Yau fourfolds. So this is a particular type of object in algebraic geometry. And those ones are related to one another by transitions that change their topology. So you could think of this data set as one big network of calabi where each fixed topology is a node, and they are related by edges when there's a simple topological transition between them. And uh, for particle physics reasons, there was a particular physics question that we wanted to ask, which is, in this elliptic vibration, uh, there was an E6, what's called an E6 Kodaira fiber, appearing with probability, like 1 in 500. And we wanted to know when and why that was the case. So in the context of, of, of our work, what we did was we, had, we trained a bunch of different algorithms. We trained a logistic regression. We trained a decision tree. We trained some others. And uh, what we found is that by opening up the box, we were able to recognize that there were certain features that were critical for making the decision, does this geometry contain this E6 Kodaira fiber or not? And based on that, based on recognizing that there was a critical decision variable, we were able to write down uh, some sort of conjecture that was iteratively refined and eventually ended up with this that is a provable theorem. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a, 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 a result where there's uh, calculations in the paper that back up the claim. And so it was a case, um, th this, this particular case is just one case of what you might do, but it's a case where there was a critical decision variable that the machine helped us identify that we then zoomed in on and we, we understood it, okay? Uh, there's some other examples, including of some friends who are in the audience, of using these sorts of ideas in algebraic geometry and in string theory. So in particular, there's something that is uh, relevant for various physics constructions called line bundle cohomology on an algebraic variety of various different types. And so uh, what this first paper was trying to do was investigating different approaches of machine learning to studying line bundle cohomology on complex surfaces sitting inside calabi threefolds. And uh, in particular, it had been observed that uh, line bundle cohomology can be described by uh, 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 dividing the Picard lattice, which is the natural data space in the setup, into, into certain regions where the cohomology dimensions are described by polynomial formulas on those regions. So there's pe they're piecewise polynomial on the different regions. And given that idea, what they did was they set up a network capable of identifying the regions, first of all, and then also identifying their associated polynomials, generating a conjecture for the correct cohomology formula in these setups. So this is this case where, again, they had some understanding of the mathematics and the way that it worked. They then used that to tailor the machine learning approach, and then they fit the polynomials, and they found that it worked out pretty well. 
There's a beautiful paper uh, by uh, a number of my, these are actually all my friends, uh, uh, including Fabian, who's speaking later, that had a similar sort of setup where they were interested in a different sort of problem, where what they were, they were interested in was line bundle cohomology in cases uh, on a curve, in cases where when you move in the moduli of the curve, there can be jumps in the, in, in the, in the cohomology according to ending up at certain sub loci in moduli space. So this is something uh, that mathematically is a well-defined thing. In the physics, it often corresponds to having extra Higgs bosons in the theory. And so uh, to highlight one of the things in their abstract, a white box machine learning approach trained on this data provides intuition for the jumps due to curve splittings. And fortunately, uh, if there are questions about that, Fabian can answer them in the discussion session. Okay, and, and so part of the thing that got us uh, uh, interested in, uh, uh, part, part of the thing that I think helped spur on this, the existence of this meeting is the fact that DeepMind got interested in this approach uh, in the last year or two, and they put out this beautiful nature paper in 2021. Uh, with all sorts of uh, pretty pictures that are a different level of, of pretty than physicists and, and mathematicians typically put out. So they were interested in knot theory, and they were interested in using machine learning to study relationships between topological invariants of knots that in some cases might be surprising to mathematicians and would allow them to prove a theorem. So in particular, there's a topological invariant of a knot called the knot signature. Basically, if you take the Seifert matrix associated with a knot, there's a symmetrized version, and its signature is, is a, a knot invariant. And then there are other types of invariants in knot theory that are geometric in a sense, even though they are topological invariants. And what they wanted to know was, could we predict the signature of the knot from these geometric invariants? What they wanted to do, and, and their pipeline is actually a couple of slides back, um, they, they have this critical part that we were calling white boxing. I, I think it's pretty similar. What They call it attribution. Uh, and they use the technique called gradient salient, saliency. So given good predictions of the knot signature, what they wanted to know is uh, can, I, uh, can, uh, can I understand or attribute uh, how much of that prediction was based on certain input features versus others. So in particular, did certain geometric invariants play a much more important role than others in predicting the knot signature? And this is what this plot at the lower left is. So there's some measure of just how much that feature matters. And you can see all of these input features, which are topological invariants of the knot, some of them mattered way more than others for predicting the knot signature. And in particular, when, once they realize that these are the important ones, there's other ways to slice the data where you can see the correlations with your eyes. So they have this thing called the meridional translation here. The coloring is the longitudinal translation. And the correlation with the signature is right here. And you can just see these streaks of colors going through the plot that is clearly demonstrating some sort of relationship between these topological invariants. So given this, they, uh, they gave this to Mark Lackenby, who is a knot topologist at, at Oxford. And uh, he wrote down a conjecture and proved a theorem. And, and here is the theorem. Okay. So I think this is very exciting. And uh, 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 it's, it's uh, a, a very nice result and a very nice paper. They also have results on representation theory, but I don't particularly understand those compared to these ones. So I'll, I'll leave those on the table. Okay. So, so to, yes. uh, just to show that uh, last uh, statement, was it a theorem or was it a conjecture? This is a theorem. Okay. This is a theorem, and in particular, uh, on my last slide, there's some extra definitions of some of the things here that, that I put in. And so there's a math paper that accompanies the, the, the DeepMind Nature paper. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's four different topological invariants that appear here, and there's this particular bound that relates them. If I understand correctly, the theorem is proved by a human. That's right. That, that's, that's right. So uh, having the machine do the proof is a, a whole different direction. But the idea here, and I think the idea in some of the pre-existing literature, is to take what you would have thought is a black box machine learning model trained on some math problem, white box it, open it up, and bring in a human, a human domain expert that can help prove the theorem. So in this case, that human uh, was Mark Lackenby. <laughs> Okay. This is actually, if you have questions on this part of the talk, this is a great place to ask them, because I'm going to go on to the next portion of the talk after that. <clears throat> so I'll take a sip of water and pause to see if there are any questions on white boxing, conjecture generation, uh, and so forth. Yes? So when you say a white box by changing the algorithm, do you mean like converting deep neural net into, for example, a decision tree, or do you mean like retraining? No, no, I, I mean from, from the beginning, just using a different algorithm. Okay. So. Uh, there are so the simpler algorithms in general are uh, less powerful, 
but more understandable. So like linear regression, not particularly powerful, but very understandable, right? Uh, decision tree is uh, much more powerful, but still understandable. And part of the concern that people have with neural networks is that because you might have billions of parameters, it might be very powerful. And in fact, there's theorems about how powerful they are, various universal approximation theorems, but uh, they're in general hard to understand. So what I meant is that one approach, rather than just using a neural network and having the information encoded in these parameters, use something that is simpler but still powerful where you can literally open up the code and there are various data in the code that will tell you which features matter the most. Yeah? Do you have situations or examples where there's a disagreement between the human and the loop and, and what the algorithm is yeah. providing intuition for? Yeah, yeah, so one, that's a great question. So one might call that error correction of some variety that, uh, in general, if you just take an ML algorithm and apply it on some data, there can be failure modes, certain types of objects where it will systematically fail in a way that a human might be able to identify and discard those as edge cases. So if it was get, doing 98% on some of the data and getting the other 2% wrong, and the human could realize that all of the things that it got wrong had some common property, you could just construct a theorem having to do with things that don't involve that property. So you could, you could find the edge cases or the failure modes and find a way to discard them. So that's, that's definitely part of the pipeline. But this also isn't, you know, this is sort of newer stuff. It's not an exact science. So indeed, it really, bringing the human in the loop will look different on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what problem you're applying it to. Yeah? Just curious if you had any experiences where the ML system says for sure there's something interesting in this specific subset of examples and a domain expert looks at it and just can't figure anything out, like doesn't see any patterns? Um, yeah, good. Um, cases where the ML algorithm might surprise people. Uh, I think there's probably many instances of, instances of this, but this is actually one of them. So uh, some, I'm not a low-dimensional topologist, but the ones that I talk to, that I work with, tell me that this was a bit of a surprising uh, relationship, because in general, there are two different types of invariants of knots, broadly speaking. Some of them are algebraic invariants, like the signature and the Jones polynomial. And others are, in a sense, geometric topological invariants. And um, these are all topological invariants of knots, but they sort of live in different worlds. And so to some knot theorists, this relationship was actually a surprising relationship because it relates objects. So sigma of k is an algebraic invariant, and the rest are geometric invariants. It relates these types of invariants, which one might have naively thought should not be related to one another. But, yeah. Well, let me let me add to that. We had a talk by Alex Davies yes. in, the, in January, and, and he he did say that they had found other patterns in the data, and uh, it was they, 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 they showed them to uh, Mark Lackenby, and you know yeah, this was like the the, the one that yeah. clearly resonated. Others were very unclear, but there might be more to be found in the data, so it does require that interaction. Yeah, and part of human in the loop is recognizing when it might be systematically making unwise errors, but other cases it might surprise you and there might be something to learn. Yeah. Um, I'll give another, I'll talk about that in a little bit in the context of chess. In the context of chess, they're the, the latest the latest and greatest. Uh, they are legitimately surprising to grandmasters in a way where some grandmasters are having the way that they think about certain attacking styles changed by the way that the AI plays. I wish I could comment on Go, but I know chess and I don't know Go. <laughs> All right. Other questions on the supervised learning part? Okay. I have fewer slides on reinforcement learning, so why don't I go through this? Please, again, feel free to interrupt, but I think we'll still have a little time for questions at the end. So that was just one modality where uh, supervised learning involves an algorithm that learns to predict outputs given inputs, but it might have error. Reinforcement learning is something that's fundamentally different. Uh, in a way that I hope becomes clear, there are theoretical guarantees associated with that. And in particular, there can be interpretable strategy that comes out of these types of techniques via gameplay or what people in the field call stochastic rollouts. Uh, that's kind of actually simple to imagine because if you're an expert at chess and you watch the best AI in the world play chess, you can actually understand in some way the way that it's playing. And I have data to show that. So let me tell you, uh, first of all, a little bit about reinforcement learning. The, the key idea from the perspective of math, I think, is that winning the game, you want to set up a game where winning the game is actually some sort of exact solution to some problem that you care about. Modulo bugs. So this is not stochastic in the way that, uh, uh, 
It's stochastic in different ways, but it's, it's not stochastic or error prone in the way that the previous techniques were. Modulo bugs, uh, you know, if it, if it wins the game, it solves some problem. And we'll hear more about this today. The basic setup uh, is to have an agent here that interacts with an environment. It perceives a state from state space S. And given that perception of the state, whether it be a chessboard or a particular knot or the fact that it's 8 o'clock in the morning, there's some action space that it can choose its next actions from. And there's a function called the policy function that tells it how to pick an action given the state. At the beginning of its life, the agent is some sort of random walker. But you might imagine in this sort of framework, if you had a way to update the policy function over time based on goodness or badness of the agent's experience, you would have a way to train it to be on its best behavior. So the way that that works is that when the agent arrives in a new state, it receives uh, what's called a reward. That reward over many time steps can be accumulated with some potential thing called a discount factor into what's called a return. So as the agent plays out 20 moves or something like that, it accumulates a reward in each state and just adds them up. This gives you this thing called the return. The expectation value over many rollouts, over many episodes of the return, given some initial start state s, is called the value function. Uh, and uh, the expectation value of a state action pair uh, given, uh, uh, sorry, the expectation value of a return given the state action pair is what's called the action value function. So see, these are some of the objects that are central to theory in reinforcement learning. This is another entire subfield of machine learning. And uh, the basic idea is to use these objects, the value function, the action value function, and the policy in various different ways such that after training, the agent learns appropriate gameplay. But the thing is, as scientists, we're the ones that get to define the games. So it doesn't have to be Go or chess. You can define this rather abstract setup and then apply it in an environment of your choosing. Uh, what might be the most famous example is AlphaZero. So there's this 2017 paper, uh, also out of DeepMind, called Mastering the Game of Go Without Human Knowledge. This was reinforcement learning that did not use any expert level games played by humans. All it was was that the agent was taught the rules it played against itself in the context of these policies and value functions and action value functions. And over time, uh, uh, AlphaZero uh, got to be the world champion at chess, at Go, and maybe also Shogi, although I don't know enough about that. So this is a, a general reinforcement learning algorithm that masters chess, Shogi, and Go through self-play and only self-play, no expert level human games. As I mentioned, uh, if you have some other environment that you care about, this is a general framework, so you can set it up. There was a paper that we put out in 2019 that used reinforcement learning to construct consistent string theories. There's some details that I am suppressing. But the basic idea, mixing the physics and the math a little bit, is that we had type 2a string theory on a Calabi-Yau threefold x. The definition of the environment involves a distinguished special Lagrangian three cycle that's wrapped by an O6 plane. Uh, the state space in this setup, because if we want to use reinforcement learning, we have to define a state space and an action space. The state space is the space of possible ways of putting these things called D6 brains, which are physics objects, on the special Lagrangian three cycles pi a. The actions in this setup involve adding a brain on a special Lagrangian, uh, or adding a brain on an existing stack, or removing, uh, misspelling, uh, <laughs> removing <laughs> brains. The paper is actually called Brains with it's called brains of that type with brains of that type. So uh, perhaps, uh, which is actually a play on one of Mike's titles from uh, years ago. But uh, I misspelled it. OK, so, so the actions are to add uh, a brain on a particular type of cycle, remove them, et cetera. And there's various rewards according to uh, the things that physicists want and care about. So supersymmetry is one of them. There's another type of consistency condition called, K, uh, called a K-theory con consistency condition. There's something called tadpole cancellation, which just to put an equation somewhere on these slides, is this particular relationship between the third homology cycles wrapped by the various physics objects. So this particular combination of where the O6s and the D6s are wrapped needs to be homologically trivial. And uh, what we found uh, is that if we break these various rewards into the three different thresholds, one where we have just tadpole cancellation, another where we have tadpole cancellation and K-theory, and another where we have those two and Susie also, uh, 
this is training time. This mean score is a measure of how much the agent is learning over time. So you see it learns, learns to cancel tadpoles very quickly, and then it plateaus for a while, uh, having learned how to cancel tadpoles and satisfy the K-theory condition, and then it eventually learns how to satisfy the Susie condition. But this is just some setup that, that's, that some, fair, some physicists care about. The, the major takeaway from the point of view of machine learning for mathematics is that at the end of the day, when we're up here, these are the conditions that define a solution of our system. And that, uh, those solutions rigorously satisfy the string consistency conditions. There is no error. So it's not like trying to predict that something is a cat and 2% of the time that you predict that it's a dog. This just is a solution. So this is a different machine learning modality that, that, that brings uh, uh, the this theoretical guarantee in by construction. And we'll hear about it later in the day in, in other contexts, in particular in the context of knot theory. Tim, so yes. you are doing EQA? I mean, got deep audio. Yes, great question. Okay. So, um, so Peter's asking which particular reinforcement learning algorithm we used. A famous one is called Deep Q Networks that uses this Q function that I told you about. We actually use something called an asynchronous advantage actor critic, which uh -huh. uses both a value function and a Q function. Um, there are other ones in other work that we use called trust region policy optimization. But indeed, uh, part of the engineering of getting things like this to work is trying the different algorithms and see what, seeing what performs best. Yeah. Okay. All of this has, yes. Worth, yeah. Perhaps worth pointing out at this point that what this thing is solving is a certain type of cubic diophantine equation. Yes, that's right. So it's some sort of number theory problem. That's good. Very relevant for this meeting. So uh, indeed, some of these consistency conditions are, are cubic diophantines of a particular type. General diophantines rigorously are undecidable. Is there an algorithm that determines whether a diophantine arbitrary one has a solution? No, there is not such an algorithm. But in this context, for the particular diophantines that appear in this string construction, given this particular type of algorithm, it finds solutions quite readily. Does that suffice? Yeah. How do you know so much about this? <laughs> Fabian's on this paper. OK, um, great. Good. Um, another key point to make, and I'm going to skip my last example, so I'll, I'll spend some time on this slide and, and then conclude. Uh, so the theoretical guarantee of this setup I just explained, this type of reinforcement learning setup. But there's also understanding. Because if you have a trained agent that has learned to be on its best behavior, you can say play n games, take n large, and then study the statistics of the, of the gameplay or the rollouts. So in the particular context that we had, in the string theory example, I did it again, categorize brains as A, B, and C type. So there's different types of brains according to how they contribute to the consistency conditions. And you can see that over time, when we study the statistics of what types of brains the agent is using to solve the system, you can see that it's clearly developing a preference for a C type brain. Uh, and these A type brains and B type brains are less preferred. It actually turns out that in the scientific literature at, uh, from, from the early 2000s, this was called the filler brain strategy in string theory. And so what the agent learned based on the way that we set up the game in this context was that to use the types of brains that uh, physicists had already figured out to use. There were other ways to set up the game such that it couldn't have learned this, but also led to better behavior. Um, in, a, in a more relevant context uh, to a broader audience, in the context of chess, you could just ask, take alpha zero, play a million games, what are the statistics as a function of how long it was trained for, for how much it plays each different chess opening, right? So in particular, here's some of the data from this Silver et al. paper from 2017. Uh, you can see that it, uh, this Carol Kahn defense time, training time goes this way. Percentage of time that it plays the game is this axis. So for a long time, it doesn't play the Carol Kahn at all. And then it starts playing it for about half of its training life. And then it decides, no, that one's not so good. I'm moving on to other things. Um, so after, after training, it's not on this, these plots. It turns out, if you're a chess player, that there's a strong preference for the queen's, uh, for the queen's gambit and for the English opening over 1e4. So, OK. There's another context in the context of these elliptic calabiaos that I find interesting. But in the interest of time, I'll just like to review and conclude. So I think a big question, question at ML for math, which is what this meeting is about, and this is very much uh, this, the, the pipelines and the big questions are things that hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll discuss. Um, but, but, but a central one is, given that rigor and understanding are so central to math, how is it 
that we are supposed to get rigorous results where we understand what's going on out of techniques that are stochastic, error prone, and black box. So I gave you these two examples of white boxing and conjecture generation. The key thing when we're, when we're generating conjectures via white boxing is to bring the human in the loop and by opening the box to gain some sort of understanding that's going to allow us to generate a conjecture and prove theorem. I gave a bunch of examples. And in the context of reinforcement learning, where an agent learns how to act in some environments appropriately over, over time, the theoretical guarantees were the fact that at the end state uh, is a state that you can actually check that it is doing what you want it to do. So uh, I gave examples of string data on special Lagrangians and Colabiaus. The one I didn't talk about was searches for particular topological properties in large ensembles of Colabiaus, and I mentioned chess. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, I left, I guess, 10 minutes for discussion. There was five in between. But uh, I appreciate you being here. It's good to see people in person. And hopefully we have a few minutes to talk about the big ideas here. Thanks. Yeah, so I have a question. This is really cool, by the way. And um, Thank you. So about the physics example, it seems that, like, contrasted to chess, it's very clear if you have a valid brain versus in chess, like, I can show you a position. Like, it's not obvious whether it's winning or not. Yes. And so in that case, is it possible that there would be more special, like, I guess you could view this as saying the horizon in this game is, like, length one. Sorry, like the what? horizon in the game? So yes. Length of the game is length one. So would, would there be approaches like banded algorithms that could work on, this, on the, that kind of question? Um, so I think by the horizon, you sort of mean the distance from some state f at which you can like see the signal of goodness or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So um, in this case, one of the conditions is the various different homological cycles wrapped by these physics objects, these d-brains. And there's a notion of being very far from this condition being satisfied or very close. And so in particular, um, what that means is that you could have some reward at intermediate times that is based on the distance from zero in some sense. Whereas at intermediate times in chess, like in the middle of a game, if you're not already an expert, it's not clear what value to associate to the state. Am I in a good position? Am I in a bad position? It's much more subtle than a condition like this. So in the context of, of machine learning, this is what's called having sparse rewards or non-sparse rewards. So in the chess examples, the reward function was literally at end of game. If you win, you get one point. If you draw, you get zero points. If you lose, you get minus one or something yeah. simple like that. At intermediate times here, because we had additional information, we, uh, we gave it rewards more often. So there is this choice. Um, whether to use sparse reward structures or more dense ones is a topic of study, but it is a central question anytime you do machine learning, that some environments may allow signal to propagate long distances from the end state, and others may not. There's another yes. good example yes, to answer the question, which is to solve the Rubik's Cube and that sort of thing. Would you I could say a word about yeah, that. Yeah, please, absolutely. So, uh, so another early or you know, your top, your problem of this sort that they got a lot of attention is to make a, a Rubik's Cube solver. And uh, so, again, you have that choice. You have some a priori information, but in fact, what was given to the uh, reinforcement learning algorithm was just uh, correct, incorrect. And if you just set up a system that uh, starts in random configurations, and was, has that reward, it has a very hard time learning. But a, a simple trick, and that, and that is, you know, the, the, the goal of reinforcement learning is to work with as far as any type of reward. And the simple trick that helped in that case was to say, we know how to generate configurations that are a given average distance by starting with the target configuration and then applying some number of moves. So you can first train the system to solve uh, configurations that can be solved in one move, two moves. Dot, dot, dot. And then they were able to very easily yep. get the machine yep. to learn this. And so, if you know something about the structure of the solution space, you can often use strategies like that. There's like a natural curriculum for like Yes, yes. Thanks. Yes, Matt. Um, regarding the conjecture generation um, part, is there any notion of what makes a conjecture interesting from a human point of view? Because I, I would think that you can conjecture lots of different things. You know, this one point, you know, there's a solution with x equals 1 or something, which is maybe true, but it's not yeah. interesting. And yes. It seems that that's a kind of a human element 
to what makes mathematics interesting in the first place. Otherwise, the problems are totally unconstrained. So how, yes. does, that, how does that go into these? That is a great question. Um, one thing that one might hope for many years from now is that you could also condition on some notion of surprise or interestingness from the point of view of the algorithm itself. But in my very specific context, uh, Fabian and I were at Caltech for a week with, with a topologist and with, with Sergey uh, about a month ago, and we were talking about this result. And naturally, compared to me, the topologist from Stanford has a much better understanding of why this is interesting than, than I do. And some of these invariants, I even had to remind myself last night what they were <laughs> before coming here and speaking on it. So um, indeed, um, I think in the various articles where DeepMind is talking about working with Lackenby, there's this back and forth about what the machine found easily versus what he found interesting or surprising or whatnot. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, I would say one goal in the long run is to Clearly, there's a subjective notion of interestingness. But one thing that you might imagine is that relative to domain <coughs> knowledge in a field at expert level, there are things that could be truly surprising and true. And those are the sorts of things that, if you could harness that, you'd like to be able to learn. Is this related? Yeah. Yeah. So to, to add to that, so um, we saw this huge decision tree. For example, where you can ask us 20 questions, and then in the end you can say, okay, so if x and y and z, and I have all these conditions, then something is true. This might be less surprising than sort of a very, very general statement. If you could just say, for any cardiality exists a unique Richard flat metric or whatever, more, I think the more general you have, the less constraints you put in, the, the more surprising it will be to, to you. But at some level, there's it generates objections, and then some person goes in and says, "Well, that's one I don't care about, so let me just not even put this in the paper." Yeah. And then there's some some you know higher level refinement to the objection generation. Absolutely. Which, so I know, think in this case it was uh, it was relating the algebraic and the geometric invariants. So they have been just sort of right. So you still need some expert knowledge in order to interpret the results and refine them. Ab absolutely, and part of this uh, this pipeline that I was talking about back here. There were, there were a couple of them. But both of these pipelines have this setup. Maybe I'll talk about DeepMinds now, where you generate the data and you train the supervised model. You use these attribution techniques to figure out which features are most important. But then you have a human that's in the loop that is helping to understand, first of all, what's interesting, and second of all, what is the relationship between these. So indeed, I mean, to go from stochastic black box and error prone to rigorous cases where we have understanding, Figuring out how to have the, the supervised algorithm or the RL algorithm interface with a human domain expert is crucial. Um, and I, I, uh, I mean, I think that they worked on this over many years, and I can't imagine it would have held uh, the domain <coughs> expert's interest unless it really was arriving at results they found interesting. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's crucial for, for now, but you can imagine in the future yes. learning what's interesting. Absolutely. Some, some training on Absolutely. other conjectures, some yeah. that are interesting or some aren't, yeah. that can be used to refine out. Absolutely. So if we if we like say that we're only going to do things that are true, then mac trying to maximize surprise relative to a domain expert's intuition or knowledge might be one way of demonstrating what's in interesting. Interesting things are often things that are surprising us, right? Um, Mike, you've been running this seminar series for a while. I mean, do, do this sort of stuff comes up there somewhat uh, somewhat frequently, right? Do you have any comments on surprise and uh, these sorts of well, issues? Well, I would save that for the uh, discussion. Sure. Yeah. We, you know, quite a bit of time for discussion. That's a very open-ended question. Uh, yes. Often, from a mathematical perspective, we're not just interested in finding patterns. Sometimes we're interested in finding counterexamples. We have something that you know is true almost all the time that we can't yes. quite prove. It's always true. Yes. yes. And a counterexample would just settle the question. One thing that's occurred to me, I know nothing about machine learning, but I've at least heard of things like generative adversarial networks where you have one machine that's basically being trained to fool another machine. Yes. And I wonder if there are any examples where that could actually be used to construct a counterexample. Yes. Uh, that is a uh, wonderful question. So I know for a fact that the talk later today will uh, address using. Uh, generative models to, uh, to have potential counterexamples. And a project that we're working on in knot theory is trying to do exactly that, that demonstrating that a knot satisfies a particular property called sliceness is something that is relevant for particular counterexamples to particular conjectures. Um, so if you could verify that certain types of knots are sliced in certain contexts, you would disprove certain conjectures. Um, so in, indeed, that's reinforcement learning and generative models are both ways to do that, and it'll be discussed later. 
I saw a hand from Keegan earlier. I don't know if you. Yeah, it was just related to the chess thing. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. So I was thinking, yeah, if it's like you, this, you're talking about sparse rewards, for yes. you know, like a one point if you win. Yes. But obviously that's hard because it's many, many moves away. Uh, and I know there's like a standard amount of like points that each piece is worth. Yes. Like capturing pieces, you could yes. say. But I'm just wondering, like, what, like, is there a real significant difference between doing between both of those ways of reinforcement learning? Like, you might miss a, a, yes. a sacrifice of a piece. I, I, yes, I can, I can be very specific in that answer, because okay. I know chess and I know what it learned. Um, so a pawn's worth one, a knight is worth three, a bishop's worth about three and a half, a rook is worth five, a queen's worth nine, and a king is worth infinity, right? So, um, so that is a human-derived notion of value of pieces. And one thing that AlphaZero definitively does what that amazes grandmasters, compared to the traditionally trained algorithms, which are material grabbers that grab the pawn, they push forward that way, is that it, it sort of systematically values positional understanding over the exact piece count. And so there are cases where it will back the opponent's king into a corner and checkmate them, even though it's down two points in some sense. So that's something where had you conditioned at intermediate times on the human-derived notions of the values of the pieces, you might not end up with a system like that, but it actually it learns to play better because of the sparse rewards. Yeah. I'll just add a little to that. There's this nice book called Game Changer, which is basically a grandmaster and a bunch of computer scientists trying to understand how AlphaZero plays chess. And in most human programmed algorithms, very much like what Jim was just yeah. saying, there's a bunch of things, including material, and then it'll evaluate a certain number of points for like an open file or something like that. And then it'll have a linear combination of those. And what AlphaZero seems to be doing is some kind of nonlinear function okay. that combines, you know, it sort of recognizes those same properties. But it's combining them in, in a subtle, nonlinear way. That, like, in certain situations, this is much more important, right. which the human-designed algorithms don't seem to be able well, to do. Well, let me add just another general comment about the way people think about machine learning: is that uh, there's this uh, first question in designing the uh, algorithm or the uh, the model, which is what kind of features can it represent and uh, learn? And so, at that point, you could say. Let's make as a feature existence of this piece, existence yeah, yeah. of that piece, and so forth. And then it's clear that it's you know, possible for the system to learn that. But then the training then will decide how much importance and what situations should that be considered important. But that first step of designing the, the features in it is often very important. Uh, if the feature is inaccessible to the machine, it will never learn. It. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, following up on that, I mean, the, the, the idea of this point piece. Pieces are worth a certain value is great for like you know you're teaching a kid how to play chess. And it's very concrete. It's something that you can tell. So now this positional stuff is maybe not so much. But is there is there an output of these networks that refines that to some simple rubric, saying you know a pawn in the center is worth one point and a knight on the on the boundary is worth minus one and those kind yeah. of things. I mean if you if, if that would be a really neat output of this that kind of replaces the simple rules. Yes. With uh, more sophisticated. Well, I, that's interpretable ML. That's, that's interpretable ML. Has that been done for chess? Or? I don't know if such a simple, what you're after is I think a fantastic goal. I don't know if such a simple distillation has been done. One thing I would point out is that the sort of thing that you're talking about is implicitly encoded in these, for instance, this value function, which is the expectation value of the, the return, the sum rewards that you get over many games given a particular state. But what you want is some sort of dimensionality reduction, some sort of distillation of this information that figures out what's truly important. And that's maybe where some of these potentially these attribution techniques could be used. So later on, there's going to be a discussion of this gradient saliency that was used by DeepMind in the context of proving this theorem that literally figured out which features were most important. But in general, that would be a fantastic thing to be able to do. The thing that's so powerful when you teach a kid chess about the simple rules is that they're simple, like pawns worth one, etc. But you very quickly realize that if your king's about to get checkmated and there's no way out of it, it doesn't matter if you're up nine points. So it doesn't matter if you're down nine points. So. Okay, why don't we uh, stop right. here and thank uh, Jimmy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh,